Radio Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Niles, welcoming you to Pat Metheny. 19. When he started gigging in local clubs with bassist Jocko Pastorius, we knew Pat was not in Missouri and we were definitely not in Kansas anymore. This unique series features Pat Metheny talking to me about his career, one of unparalleled achievement, including over 30 albums, innumerable awards, three gold records, and 12 Grammy awards, including an unprecedented seven consecutive wins for seven consecutive albums. I asked Pat to talk about the character and creative sensibility that enabled a kid from Lee Summit, Missouri, to become one of the most important artists in the history of jazz. There was no indication, certainly, to anybody that I was going to get much further than throwing rocks at girls in the neighborhood and not doing too well in school. <laughs> Key to everything would be my older brother, Mike, who was an amazing musician at a very young age. Mike is five years older than I am, and really most of the attention was rightly focused on his musical ability. My early musical experiences were sort of going to concerts that he was either involved in or interested in. So it was all revolving around the trumpet. Trumpet consciousness in general would certainly be the formative mechanism for my entry into music. I started playing the trumpet myself with Mike as my teacher when I was about eight. There was also a moment in the fifth grade where they bring this machine into the school and they play like a very low pitch and a very high pitch and say, which one is higher? <laughs> and then they gradually bring the pitches together. For me, it was sort of like, well, that first one, that was definitely higher than that next one. And I ended up getting, even when they got to the point where it was very close together, I got a really high score. In terms of my own personal sense of success in music, I remember feeling like, wow, that's pretty cool. And your parents were musical as well. Yeah, um, not professional, but uh, my dad was a very good trumpet player. I mean, he's got a great sound. He can really get around the instrument well. And my mom is an excellent singer with great pitch, a great sound. And her dad, my grandfather on my mom's side, was a professional trumpet player his whole life. He played a summer under John Philip Sousa. Hearing and seeing all that, watching my brother practice a lot, hours every day, was very formative and very important. I wondered what Pat must have been like as a kid, and Pat's brother, the wonderful trumpet player Mike Matheny, who you're listening to now, was nice enough to tell me. Pat was very focused as a kid, especially when music became an important part of his life, probably around the age of 10, and that was in the year 1964, which, if you'll recall, was a pretty important year for American popular music with the early days of rock and roll and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all of that kind of thing that was happening in pop culture that had a big impact on Pat. We were both very lucky to have this magnificent music teacher, Keith House. And also, it was around that same period of time that Pat got his first guitar. He just instantly disappeared into his room with his new prized possession and started to practice, and his commitment really hasn't changed in the last 40 years. He's still practicing. The jazz and blues scene around Kansas City back in those days in the 1960s, when Pat got to be a teenager, was really vibrant and alive. He was in a position to go to jam sessions and play gigs with some of the very best jazz and blues musicians in Kansas City. Pat has always been very generous when it comes to giving me credit as an inspiration, but I, I've always maintained that he would have ended up being a great musician with or without me. Beyond his family, Pat's clearest musical influences were Miles Davis, Wes Montgomery, and the Beatles. It all kind of kicked in for me right around 1963, 1964, which of course is when the Beatles and everything kicked in. And the guitar suddenly appeared in the panorama of all things that a kid might be interested in as a very significant cultural iconic figure of something manifested in this incredible interest in the Beatles. 
that just kind of coincidentally intersected for me with prepubescent angst and all that stuff that starts to kick in when you're 10 or 11 years old. And kind of ironically, that was also a very interesting moment in time for world culture. I mean, literally, that's the moment that the world shifted from black and white into color. And for me, it was a literal thing. Along with that comes a certain amount of natural wanting to make yourself distinct from the world around you in the form of rebellion or whatever. And the guitar became something like that for me because the truth is the last thing on earth my parents, my brother, anybody would have ever wanted me to do would be to play the guitar. The guitar, for whatever reason, in their consciousness represented everything not so good. It turns out to be correctly identified with a major chasm in the universe at that moment and I was attracted to it you know my present for sixth grade if I got such and such score on such and such test was the right to buy a guitar because by that time I'd sort of lost interest in school anyway you know that was kind of the beginning of the end or the beginning of the beginning from that point forward I literally became I would say a different person so when my brother brought home a record Miles Davis live called Four and More. Within the first five seconds of the needle touching that vinyl, my life was a different life. And all I wanted to know, and all I still really want to know, is what happened in those five seconds. What was that? As much as rock and roll might have offered me a window into rebellion against my parents and my brother and blah, 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 it offered me a far wider window to become interested in jazz because not only could I rebel against all those people, but I could rebel against all my friends and everybody else I knew in my little town in Missouri as well. Plus, and this is maybe more important, whatever that music was, was fascinating and inviting in ways that I had never experienced before. Especially with Miles, he instantly became my favorite musician and I would have to trace almost every attraction to wanting to understand something in that Miles Quintet. And I have to also say there was something about Tony Williams, the way he was playing, the sound of the ride cymbal that had an immediate resonance to me in terms of what I was feeling in the culture. Even in Lee Summit, Missouri, there was something about the way he was playing that in fact truly did represent a major change. Hearing Wes Montgomery was another massive, major change for me. There was a quality that Wes's playing had that was very much like the way Miles's music affected me and made me want to just listen to it again and again and again and again and again. Through that process of listening, you naturally memorize things. Not only what Wes was playing or what Miles was playing, but what was happening underneath them and around them. There was one West record in particular called Smokin' at the Half Note. That record became an incredible touchstone for me. Because I think that when I think about Wes or if I think about Miles, I would also describe those two guys as being the two guys who have left a sort of sonic residue that has pervaded all of music, not just jazz, since. And to me, there's only one other musician of recent times who I would include in that category, and that's Jaco Pistorius, in the sense that their sound went way beyond jazz. It was something you can't turn on the TV without hearing something that's reflecting that sound in popular culture, plus even in the most extreme nooks and crannies of the avant-garde, that sound is also pervasive. There was just this depth to it, this sound thing. As much as people talk about experimentation in music, we all get quickly a picture in our mind of a certain style of playing, almost. I would contend that the Beatles were among the most experimental of people that make records at the time. Wes, if you want to talk about marking your own time through a sound that could only be of your time, to me, his simple playing on some of those later records where he just plays the melody of, like, Windy or something like that, to me, it's much more avant-garde in a way to be able to play a solo that's eight bars long that's that deep than it is to play 45 minutes of playing free. One of the mandates of the jazz form 
that is often overlooked is that it's a form that's quite unforgiving in its view towards nostalgia. I think it doesn't actually work. I don't think I've ever really heard somebody play in a style that precedes their time on Earth. It might be really, really good, but it's not going to make me not want to hear the people that did that first. I've always tried to embrace what I love and what I feel around me now. That was true early on. And in fact, part of the reasons that I started to write tunes was because there was a way I wanted to function as an improviser that I was not able to really do playing on a blues or playing on a standard. I could play in those settings and it was fine and still fine. I still enjoy doing that. But there was a certain quality of something that I was not able to get to as an improviser until I started writing tunes that referenced everything that I loved, which includes a lot of qualities about having grown up out there in Missouri, a lot of qualities that are in fact related to what was happening in pop music at the time, and certain things having to do with the guitar itself that just had not really been looked at and were fascinating and interesting and worthy to me. And yet at the same time, my earliest success as a player around Kansas City when I was 13, 14 years old was under the auspices of sounding as close to Wes Montgomery as I could. I had braces on my teeth at the time, I played with my thumb, and I could do a good Wes Montgomery imitation. The sense of acceptance and applause and sort of getting house and all that stuff that comes with that, even at a pretty early stage, there was something about it that bothered me. I knew as much as I enjoyed stepping into that guise, it wasn't really what I had to say. And there's another maybe more important part of this, which is I love Wes so much. I realized that, in fact, it's kind of disrespectful to sound like somebody that much. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be better to look at Wes and say, wow, this guy found a way of playing that was all his own, that didn't sound like anything that had preceded it. Why not go there as a tribute to Wes? So there was a point where I just said, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, then there's a period of roughness, because that is, in fact, part of what your vocabulary is. But it was a worthy moment for me. I seriously started playing, I would say, when I was 12, and was starting to work gigs when I was 14 around Kansas City, first with amateur-type musicians. Pretty quickly after that, by the time I was 15, with some of the best players in town. I had no interest in school anyway, but by the time I started really working gigs, I was barely hanging on, to the point where, for one quarter, my parents actually forbid me from playing at all and uh, I had to put the guitar in the closet. and There was a benefit to that for me on several levels. One is that I had to really find a way to continue to practice because I, I, I think they didn't quite understand the degree by which I was already there. So I had to kind of develop this way of visualizing the geography of the instrument. The other thing was that it became pretty clear to me, and I think even to them, that the train had already left the station, so to speak. There was no stopping any of this. And then, as long as I could sort of pass, it was okay, which I kind of somehow faked my way through. At this point, you kind of have to remind yourself that you've been listening to Pat Metheny discussing concepts he was considering as a 14-year-old. So how did this kid who just barely scraped through high school get a scholarship to the University of Miami where he met future colleagues Jaco Pastorius, Mark Egan, and Danny Gottlieb? One night I was playing a club and this guy came in. It turns out it was Dr. Bill Lee, who at that time and for many years had been the dean at the University of Miami. He asked me over and said, I want to offer you a full scholarship to go to the University of Miami. And I was just in shock. You know, I went home and told my parents, and of course that was the happiest day they had ever heard in their entire life, because as far as they knew, I was going to be on welfare soon. My own feeling about it was, well, it'll be a chance to get out of Kansas City. You know, I didn't know that much about the Miami scene. There was one guy there, his name was Dan Hurley who I had met at a band camp when I was 14 or so. And he and I had stayed in touch over the years. And after literally three days of going to classes, 
I also realized I was basically illiterate. Since I was in the sixth grade, I was just practicing 10 hours a day and playing gigs. And I had faked my way successfully through school with the help of a couple girlfriends, but there was no way I was going to be able to fake this. It coincidentally happened that that same night, I heard for the first time Jaco Pistorius, who was a musician around town. I'd heard about him. He'd even been in Kansas City, and I'd missed him playing with Wayne Cochran a few months before that, but people in Kansas City were buzzing about him, and I was like, well, I got to go check this guy out. And it was everything that it could ever possibly have been and more. And we instantly became very close friends and started to do things together immediately. Dr. Lee came back to me and said, okay, we want you to teach. The University of Miami had just opened up their doors to electric guitar as an actual instrument. And I did, at that point, have a lot of experience as a player. In the middle of that, there was a chance to come back to the Midwest and play a concert in Wichita at a jazz festival where I'd played before during my high school years, and the guest was going to be Gary Burton. Gary was one of my favorite musicians. His band represented so many important things to me. The chance to go and play with him, I would have walked there. That was April of 1973. I got the chance to play a few tunes with Gary, spent a lot of time talking with Gary, and probably made enough of an impression on him because I knew his tunes so well. Um, it would probably be like that for me if some kid came up and could play the way up in its entirety. I would certainly notice that. <laughs> Gary then offered me the chance to move to Boston and teach at Berkeley, which I did. That's where I met you. January 74, right? Absolutely right. Grammy-winning vibraphonist Gary Burton described meeting Pat. Pat was 19 years old, and he walked up to me and asked me if he could sit in. And he came up and asked me if I had any advice afterwards. And I suggested that he should move to a city where there was an active jazz scene. He decided he would come to Boston. And he spent quite a bit of time just following me around. And he was a keen observer. I noticed this right away, soaking up everything that was going on. And I think that's one of the secrets of his early success. Uh, he was a terrific learner. I could never overemphasize enough the unbelievable benefits that have come to me as a musician and as a student of music through the hours that I was able to be around Gary as a player and also things that he would offer off the bandstand in terms of the way you analyze music, the way you look at chords, the way you fit into situations dynamically, texturally, you know, how much activity is required in order to achieve this or that effect and then be able to go up on the bandstand and demonstrate in the most artful way, illustrate what he just said. And also I think Gary probably recognized that I probably was going to be a band leader at some point and was incredibly generous with letting me sort of see the mechanics of it. Like, okay, tonight we got $1,000 for the whole band. You know, I'm giving you guys 50 bucks each, but I'm keeping 600 after I pay for the gas because we're going to drive to Vermont. And also kind of monitor my thing in terms of the tunes I was writing and pretty much tear them apart. Undeniably accurate and pretty ruthless, and yet at the same time not with any malintent. Just, you know, why is it that you're looking to do this when you could do that? After three years of that, I was ready to move on to, to different territory, and in many ways, it's the normal jazz trajectory, which is you play in somebody's band for a while, you take what you can from their thing, and you also then learn from their thing what you're not getting to do in that environment that becomes something of a goal for your own thing. Gary, I was invited to make a record for ECM, which was an unbelievable opportunity. And I felt like, well, if I'm going to make a record, it may be the only record I ever get the chance to make. So I really want to make sure that it's an accurate statement about what I really believe. I knew I didn't want to make a record of standards, and I knew that I didn't want to do a whole bunch of things. It was kind of a process of then carving away everything and seeing what was left that I did want to do. I can't really say too much more than what Bright Size Life is. That is a very accurate picture of where I was at at that moment that in many ways reflects things that I still believe to be true. And I'm happy to be able to say that. I think that many people look back on their first record and think, oh man, what was I thinking? I still can play all those tunes and I still go, yep, 
that's that's kind of right. That's sort of what what I feel about that. Even though I didn't really think that I played that good that particular day, and of course those were one-day records, there were many things about it that I felt were kind of new territory, and we felt so strongly about what we were doing as a trio. That became the platform for me to leave Gary and start my own band, something I wasn't really that excited about doing. But the truth is, there were very few sideman opportunities for me at that time that had the kind of opportunities musically that I was searching for. Another crucial element in the launch of Pat Metheny's career was his meeting with Lyle Mays, his collaborator for over 30 years. Within a few minutes of hearing him, it was like, well, we should play together, you know? I mean, that's one of those things where you recognize a brother or a kindred spirit immediately. And much like with Jocko, we hooked up very quickly. And literally, I can remember the first notes that we played together. And whatever the core of the Pat Metheny group sound is and has been ever since then, was there. It was there in the first four bars. You know, as much as people think we've really worked something out, a lot of it is just the way we play together. And that became and is still a fundamental platform of what the group is. The group has always been a real great spot for investigation research. And the kind of collaborative work that Lyle and I have done often is sort of in a very blurry area between composition and arranging, where we're taking material and sort of processing it through our individual and collective sensibilities, to, where we're really kind of asking the material, what can it be? What else can it be? There's a certain point when we're working together where I couldn't really say, this is me and this is Lyle. It's us and it and we're interviewing it and, and it's telling us things, you know. And we rarely disagree about what it should be. And at the same time, we have different strengths with a huge amount of overlapping. We have a lot to talk about. We've always had a lot to talk about and we continue to have a lot to talk about. Well, how was it for you, Lyle? Now, it was exciting because I thought I heard in the first few notes that I heard him play a sensibility that I could really relate to. We have a shared aesthetic in so many areas on, on so many levels. There's never really been a pattern. The process is continually evolving, which may be part of the secret to its longevity. It stretches from complete independent development of material that then is presented to the other person to sitting down as close as we are, hammering out note by note what a passage is. There have been many other notable collaborations in Pat's career with Charlie Hayden, Ornette Coleman, Michael Brecker, and Jim Hall. His most recent was with pianist Brad Meldow, which resulted in two albums and a tour. Uh, when I first heard Brad, I literally almost had a car accident. It was sort of everything that I had been hungering to hear from a young musician. All the things about melodic development and playing with that kind of great time and imagination, and mostly having such a strong point of view of music that was rendered with all this artistry was just what I had been hoping somebody was going to come along with. It's so rare to get somebody playing that instrument with such a, a unique, modern, and innovative conception. I recognized right away in Brad that he was shooting for and achieving many of the ideals that I had set for myself. Between the two of us, we had 24 pieces of music to record. It just kind of worked out that we ended up with 12 tunes that were duet tunes, 12 that were quartet tunes. And we've recently been touring. It's been incredibly uh, exciting and I think really successful musically and an incredibly enriching experience in my life as a musician. This program has been more about the why and the how than the what of Pat Metheny's career. Although the public only sees the end result, the recordings, the concerts, and the awards are only the facts of his accomplishments. But here Metheny reveals why he was driven towards music with a stratospheric drive and dedication highly unusual for a preteen. We've also seen step by step how he set and achieved each of his demanding goals. 
Next week's program will further examine the inner workings of the creative mind, focusing on the concepts and methodologies that have made Pat Metheny one of the most fascinating musicians of our time. I'm still Richard Nile saying thanks to Gary Burton, Lyle Mays, and Mike Matheny, to my production assistant Yannick Guzdala and mixing engineer Peter Dale. Niles Productions would like to thank the very executive producer David Morley and all at Above the Title. Thanks most of all to Pat Matheny for giving his time so generously, offering us a unique insight into his bright-sized life. Radio Richard.